motion to open the meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Great, thank you. Uh, all in favor, Mary, open the voting. Oh. You know, I haven't opened it yet, so I'll just say yes. Okay, we could, we could take that. Uh, all in favor, aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Great, meeting being opened, we will move on to item 2.1, the Pledge of Allegiance. Please uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, and one name, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, moving on to item 3.1 on tonight's agenda. Public input number one. Is there anybody here from the public? I would like to speak, um, say something to us, ask a question during public input one, you would have three minutes. If you could either raise your hand or put your question into the chat room, uh, now would be the time to do that under public input one. God bless. Um, Mr. Fisher, any hands? I do not see any. I don't see anything in the chat room. Okay. We'll move on to our section five of tonight's agenda, the superintendent's report, uh, starting with item 5.1 and turn it over to Mr. Nichols. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things. I'll, I'll start with uh, an overview of um, where the district is at with regard to the vaccine. Um, as of <clears throat> this morning, um, as part of uh, phase 1A, uh, we had our nurses, our school psychologists, our social workers, our uh, speech therapists, occupational therapists, and physical therapists. Uh, we made them aware that they were eligible to be vaccinated last week. And as of this morning, 14 of our employees in those categories uh, received the vaccine. Uh, and the way it works is they get uh, two doses of the Moderna vaccine, uh, one now, and my understanding is the second um, 28 days later. Um, so they'll be going for their second dose in roughly one month. Uh, the first dose, if you've read um, the recent uh, commentary in the papers, there is discussion out there uh, with Biden perhaps releasing the stockpile and not holding on to vaccines for the second dose, uh, that the second dose could be put off beyond the four weeks. And there's debate in the scientific community about whether to do that because they haven't studied the necessarily the efficacy of, of that kind of move. Uh, but for now, the expectation is that those people who are vaccinated will get their second dose uh, 28 days from the first dose. Phase 1B, um, that was announced uh, to start today, January 11th, and that includes teachers, substitute teachers, student teachers, school administrators, paraprofessional staff, and support staff, um, really anybody who works with students. And the numbers in our district are 263 full-time staff and 39 substitute staff. Uh, so that comes to a little over 300 employees. Uh, there's been a lot of... Um, I guess, uh, concern understandably about how to register for the vaccines. So there are some websites and portals up. Uh, as of this afternoon, there were really no local um, locations where people could uh, make an appointment. Uh, I made an appointment for my parents and myself in New York City at the Javits Center um, for this upcoming weekend. And I know that um, people are in the process of making appointments at Jones Beach. Uh, and again, the eligible people in 1B, um, group 1B that is, really have to navigate the portal to figure out um, where to make an appointment. The district's role in it, in this process, is to provide a letter uh, from the superintendent stating that the employee uh, is in fact employed by the Sag Harbor Schools. And then the employee shows up with the letter uh, and a photo ID 
uh, and they would be administered the first dose of the vaccine that's available, which from my understanding is again, the, the Moderna vaccine. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about with regard to tonight's report is a testing update. And I'm just to give you a little bit of context, um, it's important to realize that we've said from the start, start that the goalposts are, are switching. Uh, and nowhere is that more accurate with regard than with regard to testing and some of the announcements in terms of uh, its impact on schools uh, remaining open and, and any requirements to remain, remain open. So if you go back to July 13th of this year, at that time, uh, Governor Cuomo, who I think has done a, a very good job, by the way, I don't mean this as a criticism, but he has made some changes. On July 13th, uh, he announced that if at any point after August 1st, the test positivity rate were to go above 9%, uh, that schools would have to close. Uh, well, in fact, we're above 9% as a county. Uh, that is the 14-day average. On October 6th, uh, he announced the microcluster initiative, and we've reviewed that in previous board meetings and basically set up three zones, yellow, orange, and red. Uh, and yellow basically was if the 10-day average was above 2.5%, you had to do some things to remain open. Uh, orange and red, respectively, were 10-day averages of over 3% and 4%. And in those two scenarios, uh, school districts were required to test 20% for orange and 30% uh, for red over a two-week period, which was then expanded to one month. Uh, again, when you think about those test positive percentages, two and a half, three, and four, we're well over that uh, number right now. So the microcluster initiative, from my perspective, is sort of old news. Uh, then on January 5th, in a press conference, uh, the governor announced that any counties uh, that are north of 9% uh, would have to test to remain open. And the superintendents uh, you know, across the state have been looking for clarification regarding those comments made in the press conference. Uh, and to date, they haven't received anything. Um, so where does that leave Sag Harbor? Uh, our initial plan was to uh, comply with uh, the testing requirements in order to remain open if we were designated uh, a school within a micro cluster zone. So if we were uh, designated orange, we would indeed test 20% of the uh, staff and students who uh, are on campus. So it excludes the remote learners. We have about a thousand people. So that would be about 200 people uh, per month. Uh, so that was our original intent, but it seems like that is sort of out the window in terms of uh, school districts, at least from my perspective, being held to that. So now the, the question is, what, what do we do? Do we initiate testing on our own or do we wait for the, the governor to uh, perhaps provide some more guidance? My recommendation at this point is that we begin to test uh, sooner rather than later, regardless of what the governor says. I, I suggest that we stick to the orange designation, which would require us to test 20% of that 1,000 number that I just referenced uh, once per month. If we do that, there are really two options. Um, you could go through the Suffolk County Department of Health, who would get rapid tests from the New York State Department of Health. Uh, there would be no cost to the district uh, except the staffing expenses which would be fairly uh, expensive because you probably have to have about five or six staff uh, to run a testing site. Uh, and when you work it out, it, it works out to uh, about $4,000 a month for 200. Um, the other option would be to contract out with a private lab um, and have them do it. And the cost for that uh, scenario is the, the lab would all tests would run through insurance. So there would be no cost to the district except for those who are uninsured. In those instances, the district would be billed $85 per test. So a rough calculation, if we were to assume in Sag Harbor that there are 20% of the population perhaps is uninsured, and that's a guess on my part, but we are a pretty affluent community. 
20% times 85, do the math, uh, it's still significantly less than getting the test from the Suffolk County Department of Health. The one other significant difference between the two options is that option number one, the Suffolk County Department of Health uses a rapid test. And depending on, um, on what literature you read, the accuracy of those tests can be anywhere from, you know, the low 50s to 65%. Um, the option, second option, which is the lab uses a PCR test, which really is the gold standard and would provide uh, much more reliable data. So my recommendation to the Board of Education is to move forward and schedule a date uh, for uh, a private entity to come in and conduct those tests. I've had conversations with one outside lab. Uh, we received the script from our school physician and we're prepared to uh, move forward in the next week or two, probably about two weeks with our first date of testing, at which time we would test 100 uh, school staff uh, and students. And then two weeks from that point, we would test another 100. So that covers uh, the testing update. Um, uh, 5.3 is a, a, a quick discussion of, of where we're at with the school status in terms of being either remote or in person. Uh, all of you know that I made a recommendation uh, to remain or to go to remote the week after uh, our winter break. And the primary reason I made that recommendation, there were two reasons. Uh, number one was that I believe that the uh, there was an increased risk due to holiday gatherings and people traveling uh, for virus transmission. I believe that that risk dissipated significantly with uh, you know one week past. So I recommended that we come back in. Uh, the second consideration in, in making that recommendation to go to remote was that uh, the test positivity rate in Suffolk County was in the 12, 13% range. Uh, it seems to have leveled off for the time being. I think today was actually Today's reading is yesterday's data, but I think it's below 10% today for the first time in a while. Um, but I would not read too much into that. I still think we're in the throes of this. And, and I think that, that it's likely that that number could creep back up. Um, our challenge moving forward with, with regard to remaining in person is not gonna be the test. Uh, it's, go, it's not gonna be the students testing positive. It's going to be uh, students and staff testing positive and the related quarantines impacting our ability to effectively staff the building. So for argument's sake, if, if we had uh, multiple cases that resulted in multiple staff members having to quarantine, and I'll talk about the quarantine changes in a moment, that impacts our ability to have the necessary staff uh, to remain open. And that's something that's really beyond our control. We have our safety measures in place. But if over the course of a week, we have, for argument's sake, five or 10 test positives in the school community, and that would result in you know, 20 to 30 teachers being out for 10 days, then we're not gonna be able to remain open. Um, and you know, we'll apprise you of those uh, circumstances as they become, uh, as the information becomes available. But it's really a day by day thing at this point. Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch upon was the quarantine revision. Um, prior to uh, the 29th of December, uh, if you were um, a test positive or you were a close contact with someone, you were required to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, or if you had traveled outside of uh, the contiguous states uh, within the United States or to a US territory in a CDC level two or higher status, um, you prior to the 29th had to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, the governor changed that uh, a couple of weeks ago to say that you could shorten that by quarantining for three days and then taking a test on day four. And if that test came back negative, you could come out of quarantine. Uh, on the 29th, he shortened that 14 days to 10 days uh, and suggested that on day 10, uh, you could, if you were, uh, quarantine due to being a close contact come out and then you're supposed to monitor your symptoms from 10 from day 10 through 14. Uh, if you traveled outside of New York or its contiguous states to the places I just referenced, uh, you could choose 
to quarantine for 10 days or access that four day option that I just talked about, uh, which would enable you to come back to school either on the afternoon of day four or day five, assuming a negative test. So that's the summary of the superintendent's report. I'm happy to answer any questions. So Jeff, I, I think, um, thank you for that. There's a lot a lot of moving, moving parts and um, you guys are staying on top of it that, so we appreciate it. Um, I, I think, uh, well, one, there's a, let's just go to the, there's a question in the chat room. If you wanna just address that one question and then we can go to board questions. Sure. And I can read it if you'd like. Nope, I can see it. Okay. So uh, in, if we do the PCR test, it would be with uh, Enzo Labs, uh, which is a, a third party that has a license to conduct these tests. They have, so they would conduct the test, they, they would be sent to their own laboratory, so they don't have to send it to an external entity. Uh, and then they would actually enter the data into the New York State portal. Uh, Enzo Labs has run these, uh, these tests for other districts uh, in Suffolk County. And I've spoken to the superintendents who said that uh, they were excellent to work with uh, and the process was pretty seamless. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, with, with some of these revisions, we're gonna be updating our um, morning survey health questionnaire to, cha to change and reflect the quarantine status and the different state statuses as they evolve. Yeah, we, we, we changed the uh, questionnaire to reflect the 10-day quarantine uh, the other day. Mr. Fisher did that. Great. And I'm just repeating some of this stuff so that anybody watching or on YouTube yeah, yeah. knows that we're, we're, we're actively working on this and it's a, it's a fluid situation. Um, with respect to your recommendation that we be proactive instead of reactive in testing, just what were your thoughts on that? When do you think, what would be your, your recommendation as to when to start that? As soon as I can with Enzo Labs. So I'm thinking uh, the, the tentative they, date they gave me, which I have to confirm would be November in the low 20s, like 22nd, 23rd, 24th. I don't have a calendar in front of me, but January. in and around there. And we, what, the process of that would be consents first or sent out or just to walk the public through that so that no one is surprised when we uh, yeah, so there would be there would be consent to test and we would go with volunteers to start our original thinking was that um, if there was not significant or sufficient buy in uh, to get to that 20% point, then we would have to speak with our attorneys about the possibility of mandating the testing. But my sense is that meeting that 20% threshold for the first go around is not going to be an issue. Um, it's not that invasive a process. It's a quick nose swab, not the one that goes all the way up. Uh, and it's an opportunity uh, to get accurate data about whether or not your child uh, has the virus or not, which uh, is valuable. Cost, which I think is important. It's either insurance or the district is covering that cost. So correct. That's important. And I just saw a question pop up that would it be covered by insurance? But yes, it would be either covered by insurance or uh, the district would pay if there was a situation where there was not insurance. Correct, exactly. Um, and board questions or comments um, for Mr. Nichols at this point, or thoughts on proactive testing, anything that Jeff has covered under section five. Um, I would just add that I, I'm a supporter of proactively test, testing, even if it's not necessary. Um, I, I think it's a way for us just to make sure that we can ensure the safest environment possible. And if there are issues, we'll find out earlier. And the only way we find out if there's issues, the safer people can be. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd say thanks as well. Um, I support Jeff's recommendation. I think it's a good idea. Um, and. I think you guys are doing an amazing job and what's obviously very difficult circumstances. These are really difficult decisions to make every day, particularly where we have these state guidelines that seem to be changing all the time and a, and a county health department that has proven once again to be completely useless. So I, I, I appreciate it. 
anybody else from the board or um, at this members of the public um, that would have a question for Mr. Nichols uh, based on what he was just covered. I'm in support of Jeff's decision as well. So I I think you have unanimous uh, board support, Jeff. Uh, it sounds like you have board support. I haven't heard from I everybody. support it. I will not say unanimous. I'll say board support to uh, to move forward with that. I support it. I guess um, just from an operational perspective, when you send out all the consents to people, is that when you're going to ask for their insurance information so that it can just get billed to insurance right then and there? I'm going to work that through with Enzo. Um, but I posed that question to them the other day and they said that um, it was pretty seamless. So the details of that I'll be sending out um, with the overview uh, to the community. Cool. Sounds great. Yorgos? Yeah, I, I agree with this one also. So how is it gonna work in the beginning? So who's gonna take it first, the test? Is it gonna be just with volunteers you mentioned and then how is it gonna work from then on? Probably if we have more than 20%, which I suspect we will in terms of people willing to test uh -huh. and we'll set up some type of uh, system where it'll be rotational, where the first, you know, whoever tests the first go around obviously won't get tested two weeks later. Uh, and I envision this really going every two weeks, a hundred, it'll be 150 people actually, I said a hundred before, in order mm -hmm. for a lab to commit to do the testing uh, the minimum that they would do would be 150, not 100. So I, we would roughly be doing 30%, not 20% of our entire staff, student population in person every month, which means 150 every two weeks. And we would attempt Yorgos to go through the entire population of people um, before going back to someone a second time. And is there a maximum at, at a certain time? So if let's say half of the people, whatever they wanted to take in in the beginning, would we allow this or are we just gonna map, cap it at, at that number? I would probably cap it at 150 just because of the ongoing costs associated with it. I know I say that like, if it's 150 and 20% and of that, which is 30 times 85 is 2,400, was that 2,550 roughly? So around 2,550, if that's, I say that's nothing, but it adds up. It's 5,000 a month if we do it every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I would probably cap it at 150. That's my thinking. And just keep doing that every two weeks. Okay. And then the way it's going to work, is it going to be uh, at the school facility where they're going to take the test or is it something they're going to take with them? Because we're talking about the PCR. So is it something they take with them at home and then they do it and bring it in the morning or is it going to be all done there? It's going to be all done at our facility. So we would probably set up one area, maybe two. Uh, when I initially talked to them, they wanted one space, uh, which means we'd have to transport students from um, the three buildings to get tested. Okay. The one area. And then it will take about a day or two to get the results back, I guess, right? Depending on the speed with which their lab operates, yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, Jeff, I have a question based on what you just said. If we need to transport them, then there'll be some additional transportation charge potentially? Potentially, um, but it, we do have staff that are available. So I don't, I, don't, I don't see it being a significant charge. Thank you. Yeah. Just so I have two more questions before we move on, Jeff. One question was um, from the public, would it, will it go by grade or small group from each grade if, if, if we know at this point? We don't know at this point, but it would be uh, equitable and rotational um, as per my comments before, so that who, whoever's tested, for instance, on the first go around, another group of people would be tested on the second go around and the third go around, et cetera. And one more question, thank you. One more question from the chairman was, uh, this is the nostril wipe or uh, test versus the deeper PCR test just as an added concern to younger kids or fear. I don't know if I can get into that granular level of detail. But the question, but yeah. Was that it was uh, not the one that went all the way up, but somewhat up your nose. Right. Any other board questions at this point before we move on? Okay, if anyone from the public has another question, you can ask that at public input number two at the end of our meeting. Uh, moving on to section six of the agenda, the principal's report. 
So uh, why don't we start? Uh, let me start by saying that this evening, um, and they announced this last night, the governor is having a vaccine webinar, uh, primarily due to people asking for more information um, so that they can share it with their uh, staff. So I, I had a board meeting tonight and I couldn't attend that. So I asked Mr. Malone to attend that in my place. So we will, uh, unless Betty's ready to give a quick report, which I don't know if you are Betty, Mr. Malone didn't say that you were, I'll start with Ms. Carriero. Great. Hi, all. So um, we're excited that today was the first day back with kids. It was um, a little odd last week walking around seeing teachers talk to computers and not have the um, excitement in the hallways as we normally get to see. Um, we've been still continuing our college process and we're hearing back from colleges and our kids have been doing a great job with that. Um, remote last week, kudos to our teachers for that um, fast transition and because we are synchronously learning the, that we've been streaming every class. Um, it was a smooth transition for our families. There was limited issue with that. Um, the, in our international baccalaureate program, the students have been completing in, um, their IAs, which are their internal assessments that are done by their teachers and then our teachers are grading it. Um, Ms. Westoff and Mr. Guinan are planning their next Whaler War attack for our high school and our middle school for that school building spirit. Um, on the boring side, we've been doing the preliminary budget. So I met with all the teachers to go over what um, needs and wants they have for next year. We're gonna try to keep the budget the same as last year. Um, our school counselors have worked on, started working on numbers for scheduling and that process of scheduling for next year will begin in a month. Um, we've had check-ins with um, our students. We have a survey that goes out for the hybrid learners Mondays and Thursdays so that we can see how kids are doing and our school counselors have been on top of that. And we have been holding six through 12 grade teams to make sure we're hitting those social emotional marks for our kids. And that's about it. Great. Um, Betty, are, are you prepared to say a few words? I know if not. Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay. Um, so regarding remote learning, it uh, last week it did go really well. Look. You just went, we just lost you, Betty. Sorry, I'm on a Chromebook. It's a little tricky. All right, go ahead. Is this better? Yes. Um, so I can say uh, that regarding lear learning last week, remote learning, the teachers and the students were very well prepared. And I can say that that is in large part to the teachers getting the students ready early on, pretty much as early on as September, they've been getting their students ready for Google Classroom, how to access the applications through their um, iPad or their Chromebooks. And the teachers, as well as the students, have become really well-versed. So last, or last week, excuse me, was pretty seamless. It, it went smooth. Um, but everyone was beyond overjoyed being back in the building today, that is for sure. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bramoff, there was a, a change to athletics, uh, specifically with regard to some of our shared sports. Do you want to touch upon that real quick? Uh, yes, very briefly. Last week, uh, as you know, we were on remote instruction. East Hampton was not, so they began the season for boys swimming and co-ed winter track. Uh, We've actually done a flip-flop this week where the East Hampton is on remote learning and the Sag Harbor students will be participating in boys swimming as well as uh, co-head winter track. Uh, we will not be uh, practicing with the East Hampton students. They will return to practice with us on the 19th, I believe. Great, thanks, uh, Mr. Bramoff. And, and I, just real quickly, I, I think that the reason that our swimmers and, and uh, track uh, participants can participate this week is they're gonna be by themselves. So there's gonna be essentially cohorting going on. They're not gonna be interacting with East Hampton. So um, that's that. So now our big presentation is the first component of the uh, budget. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Buscemi. Hello everyone. I'm gonna start um, sharing my screen with you. So let me just bring the presentation up and then 
I can go ahead and start. But this is really the, um, the first step in the budget development process. Um, it really will give everyone an idea of what funds are available to support next year's budget and also give everyone a good indication of what propositions are needed for May's ballot. So I just need to try to get to... One over to the right, Jennifer, with slideshow. Across yeah, the top. it's actually covered by the top of the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so just go down to... and down into the right a little bit. Uh, yeah, let me see. You know what? Maybe I'll just go to the PDF. That might be. You can hit F five. It should start it too. Oh, you think? Okay, hold on. Let's see if that works. Oh, that's not. Thing. No. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. Let me just bring up the PDF then, because. This was fine too. And we're gonna go to image display. Okay. So um, we're also gonna talk in detail about each reserve that we currently have and a plan for the future. So after I present the plan, if anyone wants to make any changes or adjustments to the plan, I can go ahead and do that. And on the next agenda for January 25th, there will be a resolution um, on that agenda to approve the plan. So let's get started. Reserve funds. So why is it so important to have reserve funds? Because planning today and saving incrementally for expected future events can help mitigate the financial impact of major non-recurring or unforeseen expenditures on the annual operating budget. Certain reserve funds can be utilized to help protect the budget against known risks or potential lawsuits, for example, or unknown risks, such as a major storm or a pandemic. Establishing and funding allowable reserve funds for a clear purpose can also help smooth out spikes in the annual budget and in the real property tax levy. In addition, reserve funds provide a mechanism for legally saving money to finance all or part of future infrastructure, equipment, and other types of expenses and reduce our reliance on borrowing and other costs associated with debt issuances to finance capital projects and acquisitions. So according to the State Controller's Office, an important concept to remember is that a reserve fund should be established with a clear intent or plan in mind regarding the future purpose, use, and when appropriate replenishment of funds from the reserve. Reserve funds should not be merely a parking lot for excess cash or fund balance and school districts should balance the desirability of accumulating reserves for future needs with the obligation to make sure taxpayers are not overburdened by these practices. And there should be a clear purpose or intent for reserve funds that aligns with statutory authorizations. And some of the recommendations from the controller is that the board should routinely review reserve fund balances and determine if reserves are funded at appropriate levels and in accordance with statutory requirements and policy the board and district officials should develop a formal plan indicating how much money will be reserved, how each reserve will be funded, and when the balance will be used. And in addition, the board and district officials should review the reserves at least annually to determine if the amounts reserved are necessary and reasonable. And if they're not reasonable, then the reserves should be reduced to levels in compliance with statutory restrictions. So this is our historical fund balance. And um, you can see it goes all the way back to 2008, 2009. And our fund balance is made up of all of these categories. So we have assigned fund balance, we have reserved fund balance, non-spendable fund balance, unreserved fund balance, unreserved undesignated fund balance. So all of this money is actually set aside to either pay for prior year expenditures current year expenditures or plan for the future, um, many of these reserves can be used to pay for future costs. And also we have part of our fund balance as what we would call our emergency fund. Um, it's our fund balance that is not earmarked to pay for any, any expenditures. And if in fact there is an emergency or we do need to um, tap into our fund balance, we can use that. And that is our unassigned fund balance. 
The unassigned fund balance is limited to 4% of our budget each year, but that is really the only category of fund balance that is not earmarked for other, other expenses. So our reserve for encumbrances, which is the top line, and I think depending on your view, you might be getting cut off on some of, some of the numbers, but um, you could see that at the end of the 1920 school year, we had $447,257 worth of fund balance that was set aside to pay for encumbrances. And encumbrances are goods and services that were purchased last year. And we either did not receive the goods or we did not, or the services weren't rendered by June 30th. So we had to set aside some of our fund balance in the current year to pay for those prior year expenses. The reserves that we have go, um, we have nine reserves now. You can see back in 08, 09, we only had one reserve and um, we've, our financial condition has been improving uh, tremendously over the years. And we're gonna go into detail and talk about those nine reserve, reserves later on. Um, we had one non-spendable reserve, which was advances to the school cafeteria, which we now actually incorporate into the budget each year. So that's why you don't see that from 2012, 13 on. We also have appropriated fund balance, which is on the bottom of the page. And the appropriated fund balance is really all the reserves that are um, fund balance that's set aside to pay for a current year's uh, costs or fund balance that was set aside to support the current year budget. And that you can see go, at the end of 1920, that was $1,591,783. So that money is already earmarked for current year. And then the unassigned fund balance, which is $1,773,297, which is really our emergency fund. And we could use that money if something happens throughout the year, um, if there's some type of emergency occurs that we didn't budget for, um, the board can tap into those funds if needed. So through the years, uh, as I said, where 2008-09, we only had one reserve and we only had $65,000 worth of emergency funds in the bank. So um, going forward, the financial condition has improved and um, has been a direct result of our Moody's upgrades that we've actually received. So in February 16, the district received our first Moody's upgrade, which was the direct result of having a healthy fund balance. And our credit rating went from double A3 to double A2. And then in May of 2020, the district received another Moody's upgrade, which was fantastic. And um, you could see a quote from our district's financial advisor that our long-term underlying credit rating uh, went from triple A2, I'm sorry, double A2 to double A1, which is just one notch below the highest rating of triple A. And as the district's financial advisor, he basically stated that the improved credit rating was going to result in lower interest rates on any future debt offerings by the district, including its annual cash flow borrowing. So that's including our TAN that we borrow every year. Mm -hmm. um, we are receiving the best interest rates that we could possibly receive because of this upgrade from Moody's, which is the direct result of having such healthy reserves and a healthy fund balance. So let's move on. So this is the results of our operations from the end of 1920. And at the end of 1920, we were able to add $920,847 to our fund balance. So our fund balance at the beginning of the year was $14,318,411. And we ended the year at $15,239,258. And that increase really came about from um, expenditures. Our, we underspent on the expenditure side. We collected less on our revenue side, but we spent less on our expenditure side. So that variance was a positive variance for the year, which um, is still only roughly 2% of our budget. And you could see in the middle of the slide how that variance um, and how that money was set aside and used. So during 1920, we actually used $553,000 worth of reserves. We increased other reserves by 1.4 million. We had interest that we earned on our reserves of 20,000. And we also increased our unassigned fund balance, which is our emergency fund. We were able to increase that by 50, roughly $58,000 because we're limited to that 4%. 
And we also um, had a decrease in our year-end encumbrances, and we in, but we did increase our appropriated fund balance. So this appropriated fund balance is uh, much higher than what the district has appropriated in the past. And that was a, the direct result of the 20% uh, state aid reduction that we were told that the district was gonna have to incur for the current year. And this is the fund balance at the end of um, June 30th, 2020. So this is the detail of exactly which reserves increased, which reserves decreased, um, how much interest was earned for each, result, uh, each reserve, and how our unassigned fund balance also went up. So we really did um, end the year in great shape. So now I'm gonna go through every single, each reserve that we have and give everyone a little bit of historical information on how the reserve, when it was adopted, um, whether it was increased throughout the years and how it was used. And we're also gonna talk about what we're recommending for the future. So we have an unemployment reserve and this was actually created by the board in June of 2012. And a referendum was not required to create this reserve. Um, it's also not required to expend monies from this reserve. The reserve itself is money set aside to just pay for unemployment costs to the state insurance fund. So you can't use this money for anything else but to pay for unemployment costs. The reserve is monitored every year for adequacy. And the funding level, which was set back in 2012, was $100,000. So at the end of June 30th, 2020, our balance was $101,080. So that means that the reserve is fully funded and it cannot be increased unless the Board of Education authorizes um, an increase to this reserve. The, our June 30th, 2021, so we're saying at the end of this school year, um, we're, our recommended balance should really be $101,080 plus an interest. Um, at the end of the year, if there is any surplus funds available, this is probably not the reserve that you wanna add monies to. Um, historically, our unemployment costs have not been high. Uh, you can see down at the bottom, 1920, we did end up with a little bit higher than the previous years, and that was a direct result of COVID. Um, and a lot of our employees, most, well, pretty much the majority of our employees um, received their full pay, but there were some substitutes that did not get paid and they were entitled to unemployment. Um, and there were some other reasons why other employees were able to collect unemployment. Um, and you can see for the 2021 year-to-date unemployment expense is rather high. But uh, for now, we're not recommending an increase to this reserve yet. We don't really see that. But of course, we'll monitor that going forward. Then we have our insurance reserve. And the insurance reserve was originally set um, or approved by the board in 2013. And it did have a maximum cash balance of $750,000. In 2016, the Board of Ed amended the insurance reserve to eliminate the cash balance maximums. So they understood that this is a very important reserve to have because it does fund all of our uninsured losses. So if there is some reason that we are going to um, have a lawsuit out there and our insurance company is not gonna pay it 100%, we could go ahead and tap into this reserve and use, that, and use these funds. And we have actually used these funds um, a couple of times in 2020, and um, you can see the balance is uh, increasing and decreasing throughout the years. So the funding method is uh, basically we're not able to add a lot of money to this reserve each year. So the according to general municipal law, the amount paid into this reserve fund during any fiscal year may not exceed the greater of $33,000 or 5% of our budget. So of course, 5% of our budget is much more than 33,000. So we're really capped at adding 33,000 a year to this, to this reserve. Um, at the end of the year, our actual balance was $1,508,000. And um, we're recommending that at the end of June 30th, at the end of the current year, if there is surplus funds available, that we do increase this reserve by the $33,000, which is the maximum contribution. And at that time, a recommendation would be made to the board to increase this reserve. And of course, any interest earned will also be added to the reserve balance at the end of the year. Then we have our workers' compensation reserve. And this reserve um, was created back in 2012, and it did have an original maximum level of funding set at 200,000. 
Um, the limit was increased several times. So in 2013, the Board of Education increased the level to 500,000. And in 2019, the level of funding was increased to 850,000. So, and this is to pay for workers' compensation costs only. Any sort of medical hospital costs related to workers' compensation can come from this reserve. Um, the funding level at 850,000 now, um, is really the limit, we, we are fully funded. The reserve can no longer be funded unless the funding level is increased. And if the funding level is increased, uh, future funding would be authorized by the board through budgetary appropriations or year-end surplus. So we are not recommending at this time, at the end of this year, to increase the balance of this reserve or increase the funding level. So we feel that the 854,000 is adequate and um, this reserve will just be increased by the interest at the end of the year. And according to our recently audited financial statements, which um, you actually received that financial report back in November, the district share of our total undiscounted workers' compensation liability for incurred but unpaid claims and incurred and reported claims is $288,479. So that's why we're saying based on historical actual expenses, the current balance seems reasonable to cover future workers' compensation costs, unless the district, of course, has a, experiences a catastrophic event where we have, um, for some reason, employees that were um, injured, and and you know we would come back to the board and we would also we would make another recommendation at that time. We have the repair reserve, and the repair reserve fund was created um, after it received voter approval. So the voters actually had to approve this reserve being created. This couldn't, um, the Board of Education was not authorized to um, create this reserve on its own. And back in 2015, um, the reserve was uh, set aside to pay for repairs. So repairs to capital improvements or equipment. And these are the type of repairs that don't occur annually. So these are not, um, to, this money is not supposed to pay for maintenance kind of projects. It's really supposed to be um, repairs that only happen once in a while. Um, and it's very flexible if you need to use this money. Uh, you only need to have a public hearing and the public hearing um, has to happen at least five days um, after publication of a legal notice. If for some reason there is not enough time to have a public hearing or issue that legal notice, um, in an emergency situation, you could use this money to pay for um, to pay for that emergency, and uh, you just have to go ahead and have a vote of two thirds uh, from the board of education, and you have to pay back those funds um, in the ensuing years. And this reserve is going to be monitored annually, like the other reserves. Um, Right, the funding level back in 2015, it was set at $2.5 million. So during the 15-16 fiscal year, the Board of Education authorized the use of $747,725 to fix the boilers in the elementary school and also pay for district-wide site work repairs. Um, funds that are spent from this reserve cannot be replenished. So as a result, this reserve is fully funded and cannot increase unless the funding level is increased by referendum at a future date. And right now we are not recommending that um, the funding level be increased and we feel that the balance is adequate to pay for any sort of uh, repairs that are gonna be needed in the upcoming years. The retirement contribution reserve. So originally the retirement contribution reserve was set aside to just pay for expenses to the employee retirement system. So the district has two retirement systems that we pay into. It's the employee retirement system that all of our non-instructional support staff are members of. And then we have the teacher's retirement system, which all of our instructional staff are members of. So in the past, we were only allowed to set aside funds to pay for employee retirement contribution costs, non-instructional. But back in 2019, they changed the law and they said that they were going to allow schools to have a sub fund of the retirement contribution reserve to set aside money to pay for teachers retirement costs. So back in 2019, the district did create a sub fund and they did set aside some monies um, into the teachers retirement uh, reserve. So this and all of this money 
goes directly to pay for retirement contribution. You cannot use this money for anything else but that. So there's no maximum funding level for the reserve. However, the amount of money is contributed annually to the TRS sub fund cannot exceed 2% of the total compensa compensation or salaries of all the teachers employed by the district and who are members of TRS. Nor can the balance of the sub fund exceed 10% of the total compensation or salaries of all teachers employed by the district. So we're not anywhere near that 10% threshold. Um, future funding of this reserve will be authorized by the Board of Education through budgetary appropriations or year-end surplus. The actual balance of our ERS reserve, so this is the amount of money we have set aside to pay for non-instructional staff's retirement costs, is $1,338,766. So we are recommending at the end of the school year that that balance remain the same and that we only add interest to it. Um, we feel that this reserve is adequately funded. Our 1920 ERS expense was $467,437. So we have roughly three years set aside in ERS reserve if for some reason we have to tap into this money to um, fund future budgets. The TRS reserve on the other hand though, we only have at the end of um, June 30th, 2020, uh, $692,890 set aside in this sub fund. Um, we are hoping that at the end of this school year that there is some surplus fund available and we can add to this balance because you could see that in 1920, our TRS expense was over $1.5 million. So we do not even have less than half of our TRS expense um, set aside in this reserve. So we feel it's really not adequately funded and that it should be increased um, each year until it is adequately funded. And until we do have, um, until we meet that 10% threshold or we have at least three years of um, TRS expenses set aside in reserve. And then this is the employee benefit accrued liability reserve. And this reserve is our oldest reserve and it was created back in 0809. And this reserve is for money set aside to pay for um, employee benefits that are accrued when employees retire. So when employees retire, if they're entitled to get paid out for their sick leave or accrued time, it could come directly out of this reserve. So um, generally this fund can be used to pay for items such as retirement incentives, um, cannot be used to pay for retirement incentives, payroll taxes, or any sort of retiree health insurance. So it really is only to pay for accrued leave. Um, Right now, this reserve, the funding level, it should be funded at 100% of the district's accrued liability. And right now it is. So the balance at the end of the last school year was $449,135. And we're recommending that at the end of this school year that we do not increase those funds and we just add, of course, the interest. And this is based on our district's liability for compensated absences. So our compensated absence liability right now is lower than the 449. So we feel that this reserve is adequately funded. And then we have our facilities capital reserve. So the facilities uh, renovation capital reserve fund was created back in 2011. And the maximum amount that could be deposited into this reserve was $5 million with a period of probable usefulness of 10 years. So you can see that this is actually expiring this May. So May of 2021, this the period of probable, use probable usefulness of this reserve has expired. So um, this is one of the propositions that we're going to recommend that gets added to the ballot in May is that this reserve be, um, that we have a new reserve created that um, we could, have for long-term planning going forward. So the purpose of this reserve fund is to pay the cost of any object or purpose for which bonds may be issued or for objects or purposes of a school district pursuant to local finance law. An expenditure from the reserve fund must be authorized by district voters and it must be for a specific purpose. So this is really for capital projects going forward. So anything that needs to get um, you know, repaired, you know, big, big projects, you need voter approval uh, to, use, to use any money from this, from this reserve. And you also need voter approval to establish the reserve. So during the 13-14 fiscal year, voters approved the use of $873,600 for various capital projects. 
during the 16-17 fiscal year, voters approved another 1.2 million to undertake other capital improvements, considering of, um, which consisted of some window replacements at the elementary school and the high school. And those funds cannot be replenished. So this reserve is fully funded and the probable term will expire. So we are recommending that voters do establish a new capital reserve at the upcoming budget vote on May 18th to continue using this reserve. Our actual balance in the reserve fund now is just over $2.9 million. Um, if voters do approve this proposition, which would be proposition two, proposition one would be to approve the budget for 21-22, um, we're hoping that we do have surplus funds at the end of the year that we could add to this reserve. So we would be, our recommendation is that the reserve, the new reserve be established and it be capped at $15 million over a 15 year period of probable usefulness. And that the current $2.9 million would be rolled over and be part of the initial funding source of the 15 million. Future funding of this reserve will be authorized by the board in an amount not to exceed 1.5 million in any given year during that 15 million during that 15 year term. And of course, no monies can be expended without a separate vote by the community for the specific capital project. Establishment or use of the capital reserve fund will not have any impact on the 21-22 school district budget or tax levies uh, going forward. And then we have our transportation capital reserve fund. And this is the last reserve that we'll go through over tonight. And um, this reserve fund was created after it received voter approval in 2010. And then the um, voters also approved an increase to the reserve in 2017 of an amount not to exceed $2 million. And the probable term of this reserve fund shall be 15 years. So the purpose of this reserve is to finance in whole or in part the replacement of any of the buses in our, in our fleet. The funding level of this reserve, the reserve right now is fully funded and cannot increase unless the funding level is increased by referendum at a future date. So um, on May 21st, 2019, the district voters approved a proposition authorizing the use of $178,446 from this reserve. And then on June 9th, 2020, the district voters approved the use of 56,000 to purchase an additional bus from this reserve. So funds spent from this reserve also cannot be replenished. And if the funding level is increased in the future, um, the, the future funding would come from budgetary appropriations or urine surplus. So our actual balance at the end of the last school year was $1,777,271. And we're recommending that the balance for the end of this school year remain the same, of course, because we're not going to put a set, another proposition um, out there to ask voters to increase the amount of this reserve or establish a new reserve, but we would like to put a proposition out in May to use some of the funds in this reserve. So we need to replace one of our smaller buses. That bus, we just got a quote, is $58,766. So we're hoping that we could place proposition number three on the ballot in May to purchase this bus out of this reserve fund so that it would have no impact on the tax levy and um, no impact on, on the budget other than the decrease in that reserve. And going forward, we have a lot of budget presentations planned and we're gonna pretty much have a budget presentation at every uh, board meeting going forward. So today we went through fund balance and reserves and this is the budget development calendar that we're proposing. On January 25th, we have a big meeting planned and we're gonna go through salaries and employee benefits. And that is roughly 70, more than 70% of our budget. So that is going to be a huge portion of our budget that we're gonna review on January 25th. On February 8th, we're going to start going through our revenue projections for next year. We're gonna go through the um, Board of Ed and Central Administration budget areas and departments. And we'll also be reviewing the facilities, technology, and transportation budget needs for next year. March 1st, we'll review our tax levy limit. We're going to talk about how that tax levy impacts um, both of our, all of our taxpayers living in both towns. 
We also will present the elementary school budget, the middle high school budget, um, athletics, special education, and our BOCES budget. And then we'll have two meetings, which is March 15th and April 10th, where we will be reviewing the entire budget again. And we can go ahead and, of course, um, update all of our budget projections based on all of the incoming information that's going to be also coming in at the same time. And this will give the board an opportunity to also fine tune many of the different budget areas and ask any questions that they may have. And on April 20th, um, the board will be adopting the budget. So after April 20th, once the budget is adopted and the property tax report card is adopted, there can be no more changes to the budget. Um, April 10th, we'll hold a budget hearing, which is required by law. And then that will bring us right into the May 18th uh, budget vote. So does anyone right now um, have any questions on any of the slides or would like me to go back to any of the slides? Hey Jennifer, it's your go, so I'll go first. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at the capital reserves uh, and you're saying that that's going to increase from 2.9 to 3.9 million for proposed for next year? Oh, the um, facilities capital reserve? Yes. This is really me being very optimistic and hoping that we do have some money left over at the end of this year. And if we do have money left over, the, the priority um, for me in looking at all nine of these reserves, mm -hmm. the priority would be to fund that capital reserve. So any money from this year or any future years should go right towards that capital reserve because we are going to be, um, we're right now we're working off of our uh, building condition survey. We're in our fifth year of a building condition survey and we're gonna be having a new building condition survey that um, will be prepared for next year. And there's going to be millions of dollars worth of renovate, uh, renovations, really uh, capital improvements and repairs that need to get done throughout all the buildings. And if we have a healthy facilities um, capital reserve set aside, we will not need to borrow funds. And that's what we really would love to be able to just pay for these projects in an ongoing manner without having to borrow and not having to pay interest. And um, that's really, that's really for me. And I think um, that's out of all nine reserves, that's really the reserve that we really need to, to increase mm -hmm. whenever there's is surplus. In your estimate, I mean, for, for the Sac Harbor Learning Center, there's no more like expenditures we're planning to do for capital projects, right? Well, I think the Learning Center does have some small projects that need to get done. I know that um, we may need to purchase uh, some sort of like dehumidifier system for, mm -hmm. for the basement level. I know I spoke with uh, Paul and um, he actually said that there was some still some minor things that needed to get done. I know the windows, there's some window repairs that need to get done. Um, they were never replaced. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be a small project. So there are definitely some things that will be needing, needing to get done there. And then I mean and, Sorry to interrupt. I remember when we were doing the walkthrough, we were talking at some point about insulation in the gym, right? Mm -hmm. That we did before. That could definitely be a project. And don't forget, we also have our repair reserve. Mm -hmm. So if we have a project like the windows where we're not replacing the windows, we're just repairing them, mm -hmm. then we could go ahead and tap into those repair reserve funds. And we really do have a healthy uh, repair reserve balance. Um, that balance at the end of the last year was $1,761,000. So that's, um, it's fantastic to have something like that, you know, set aside for anything that comes up throughout the year. And we don't need voter approval to use our repair reserve funds. So okay. we can go ahead and tap into that after a public hearing. And then the next reserve, I have a question is the transportation fleet reserve. So you estimate that's going to be about 1.777 million, right? That is our balance currently. So that was the balance. We ended the 1920 school year with that much money in that reserve. Okay. I mean, do you see like a purpose of keeping it that high? Well, a lot of the money that went into that reserve was generated from our transportation contracts. Uh -huh. So the reason why that reserve was increased was because we, um, we transport students for our surrounding districts. And at the end of the year, we were supposed to be taking $100,000 at the end of every year to increase this reserve so that district taxpayers would never have to pay for another bus again. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and that that those buses were going to be paid for by our surrounding districts who we're providing services to. Mm -hmm. So after we do an analysis of, the, of those contracts and see where we're ending up at the end of the year, um, I think going forward, you know, right now we're not recommending that that be increased, but moving forward, you know, we may want to think about um, setting aside, you know, some of that money to pay for some other types of uh, one shot type of um, expenses that we have instead of it funding our operating budget. So if we are in fact generating um, the 100000 every year, instead of adding it to this reserve, we might want to take that 100000 and pay it towards our debt service. So that it's not funding our operating budget because once it's gone, it's gone. Okay. So, and then I have a, a general question. So based on looking at all the reserves, do you see like that they're used appropriately or do you see like any room for any of them to be decreased? I think right now we have many reserves that are really adequately funded. And that's why in the plan, we're recommending that the balance remain as is. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I do feel, so I wouldn't say that anything needs to be decreased. Um, I feel that if you have one or two years worth of expense set aside and in, for retirement, I really think it should be three years of mm -hmm. expense set aside, then we're going to be able to, um, really plan all of our future budgets without having to worry about a huge spike in our tax rate. Because if we have any budget going forward where for some reason our tax levy limit is like next to zero mm -hmm. and we need money to fund our ongoing costs, we can tap into these reserves, have them fund our expense that year, and we won't have to have our taxpayers see a huge spike in their um, in their taxes for any, for any year. So it's great to have this. It's great for planning purposes. We haven't finished our budget or even really began most of our budget for next year. And we may actually be tapping into some of these reserves based on how the numbers turn up. All right, sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I think it was extremely helpful. I, I would ask that we could put these slides up on the district website so that the mm -hmm. public them because I think they're very informative and they in simple terms lay out what each is for so that the, if there were confusion you know from the public or questions it, it's really identified here so thank you for that um so I was just asking okay. with Scott to get these up on the district website so that everyone can see them I think that's super important um and with that if, are there any other board questions uh for Jennifer uh, yes, can we, uh, first of all, Jennifer, I want to thank you. I think this is like an excellent primer on reserves besides giving details about our district. Just the fact you've kind of defined each one is a fabulous tool for anyone to look at going forward. So thank you. This, I'm sure this was a lot of work, but it's excellent. Um, can we go back to the TRS slide, please? Yeah, let's go back to the TRS slide. Uh, the retirement contribution, basically the one that has the balance. Yes, I think you I think you mentioned that you wanted to build it um, to three per, you wanted to build it and it could go to uh, up to three percent of our yeah I, so, I was confused by that so if you don't mind just reviewing that again that would be helpful thank you yeah this reserve is a little tricky because um, we're very limited on what we could actually um, deposit into the reserve at the end of the year right so you can see our TRS expense is very high. It's over right. 1.5 million every year. It goes up every year. Um, and right now in the sub fund, we have less than $700,000 set aside. But if you look at the, um, the actual funding level, there is no maximum level of funding, but the amount of monies each year that can be actually contributed um, is limited. And I just wanna see if I have it on. Let me just make sure I have one, so. Yeah, so this is really it. So there is no maximum funding level for the reserve. However, the amount of monies contributed annually to the TRS sub fund cannot exceed 2% of the total comp compensation or salaries of all the teachers employed by the district who are members of the system paid during the immediately preceding fiscal year. So what we would have to do is we would have to see exactly what we paid, what we paid out to the teachers um, or all the instructional staff for the 2021 school year. And we can take 2% of that. And that's how much money could actually be added to the reserve. 
So it's 2% of what all the teachers or instructional staff are paid is what our maximum deposit could be each year. Okay, so we, we, can't, we can't deposit enough to cover our expenses every year. So every year, at least for the receiver future, you think we're gonna have to move stuff around to cover this? No, because right now we're, we're, hope, we're not planning on using this to okay. um, fund our budget for 21-22. We're hoping that we don't have to touch these funds. Um, if we are going to, you, if we are going to need funds to support the budget next year, we probably will tap into the ERS reserve and not the TRS reserve, just because our ERS, our ERS reserve is fully funded and we do have three years set aside. So okay. if, we'll, so in planning, we'll probably take funds from that reserve and not the TRS reserve. All right, that makes sense. And then something that is, uh, I know we talked about uh, transportation. Um, at a future date when we do have time, I think we've talked about, this is previous to returning, kind of the, the desire to have an, uh, kind of a deep dive analysis on our transportation costs, just to have a better understanding of it, since we do, you know, since we've kind of built this internal transportation department um, and we're, we're, uh, we're running a much larger um, effort there than we did a decade ago, just to have a better understanding of that. I know I'm not expecting that now because there's so much else going on. Um, yeah, that's terms, definitely something I have on my to-do list. <laughs> yeah. It's very long to-do list, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> separately, there have been some years when we were um, had, had our uh, schedule of budget presentations that we actually had budget workshops that were separate from our board meetings. And mm -hmm. I'm an advocate of that because in a workshop setting, there's a better exchange and it's not, you know, squeezed in between uh, like a business meeting agenda items. And when it's a workshop, it's just more, you, know, you can ask questions as they come up. Those that might be um, participating can, you know, from the public can participate more. So I'm just wondering if we've thought about kind of you have the workshop and then afterwards you have the business meeting. Chris, let me interject. I, I actually wrote the Board of Education uh, uh, between a week or two ago about this mm -hmm. very issue. Right. And solicited feedback. I'm not sure you saw that, but the feedback I got from the board was they were in support of uh, the presentations being within the context of a regular meeting. Brian, do you want to interject? Yeah, I'm just bringing it up because I don't think we had a, we, like we didn't have a discussion about it. Um, it was email, and so I was sharing, I don't know, I think most board members weren't on the board when we had workshops, so I was just advocating that I thought they were um, more inclusive publicly, that's all. But if, you know, if people still don't want to support it. Just to, just to I think that, um, I, I think what you're talking about is what we, we hope to accomplish here, Chris, not separate them into workshop and business meeting, but have it uh, similar to town hall style with the board, with the public, with the administration, um, as we have for, for meetings so far this year. So mm -hmm. that will accomplish um, the way it is set up, uh, will accomplish what, what you are uh, seeking, which I think is important so that we have interaction with the public in a town hall style. So, you know, how it's crafted on the, on the agenda may be different, but the intent and how it's gonna apply uh, are there and that framework is gonna work that way where we will be interactive have questions, answers with both the board and the public and administration. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Is there any other questions? If not, um, I'm going to place a resolution on the agenda for the next meeting for the board to just approve the reserves plan and then we'll also be attaching this presentation to that, to that resolution. So, and of course, if there's anything else that you want tweaked or changed, we can also go ahead and do that. So, thanks. Great. Let me not, I guess I gotta stop sharing my screen. <laughs> stop share. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Great, any other questions uh, for the, by the board uh, for Ms. Buscemi? Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, off to a good start. So with that, we will move to section seven of our agenda, which are policy actions. Is there a motion on policy action 7.1 to approve the second reading and adopt policy 3520? 
So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, can we open up the voting, Mary? That's unanimous. Thank you. Item 7.2 on tonight's agenda, which is approved the second reading and adopt policy 5676. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, is there discussion? Okay. Seeing and hearing no discussion, Mary, please open up the voting. That's unanimous. Moving on to our consent agenda. Is there a motion for consent agenda items 8.2 through 8.17? So moved. Is there a second? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I just wanted to welcome the new employees to the district. Absolutely. Say thank you for joining the team. Thank you very much. Mary, please open up the voting. And by the way, it's nice to see some alumni on that list. That's unanimous. Okay. On to section 10 of tonight's agenda, uh, committee reports, starting with 10.1, the athletic committee. Is, any, is, is there anybody, faculty or board, wants to give an update on the athletic committee. If not, I know uh, we can, we can, we'll carry this over as well for Ms. Krull uh, at the next meeting. Okay. Item 10.2, the audit committee. Is there any faculty or board member that would uh, wants to share anything uh, as an update to the audit committee or its work? You don't have to, we just wanted to place these on the agenda so that if there was something, we could inform everybody. Not at this time. Very good. Item 10.3, the communications committee with the same caveat, if there is anything that wants to be, anyone wants to share, now would be the time to do it with respect to the communications committee. Scott, do you want to share an update? Since you're co-chair. Sure. Um, so the, the committee has met a number of times now. Um, a couple of times per month. The goal is to put together an updated uh, survey to send out to faculty, uh, parents, and to some extent students, uh, probably just the oldest students, to get a, a better understanding of um, how, it, how we could better improve the communications both from the district out to those, uh, those people and from the outside back into the district and, and within the district as well. So that, that's been the primary focus. Um, we've broken out into subcommittees. We came back from subcommittee with um, some work last week. And uh, Chris, I don't know the timeline exactly. Maybe you could help me out, but I know there's a push to try to get something before the board uh, sooner than later. I, I think the, the goal was to try to have something to present to the board at the next board meeting. All the input was due on the on the questions by Sunday, um, and then it was going to be uh, summarized and sent to administration for review ahead of time. But I don't know if I don't know if uh, yesterday's deadline was met. Um, but that but that was the intent. But the the ultimate goal is to try to have the recommendations to the board before the budget vote. So so being able to implement the survey before that, then to to draw the recommendations. So if it had an impact on the budget. Or budget recommendations that would come in time before the final budget vote. Right. So we will keep you posted on uh, where things go from here. Thank you. Um, moving on to item 10.4, the diversity and inclusion committee. If there is anything to report or anything that faculty, board members, or anyone would like to share with respect to that committee at this time. Uh, yes, I can share that this month for January, our subcommittees are meeting for the entire month. So as an extension of diversity and inclusion, we have four subcommittees and that is the student subcommittee, 
that is the professional development subcommittee, classroom libraries, and also tough topics, which is the film series, the collaboration that we have with John Germain Library. There is a meeting scheduled every week for this week of January. The student subcommittee has already met. And then I would love to share how all of these meetings went for the February meeting, um, Board of Ed meeting. I can wrap up how those meetings went and share what was discussed. Absolutely. We also, will uh, have these. February 1st. Uh, February 1st is our full subcommittee, uh, full committee meeting for diversity and inclusion. Monday, February 1st from 4 to 5 p.m. Great. Thank you, Ms. Renoso. I didn't mean to cut you off there. It froze. So I thought you had stopped speaking. So my apologies. Um, we will we will be keeping this section on all agendas going forward. So there will be an opportunity to share and keep everybody informed going forward. So yes, uh, February will be an opportunity for that. Um, item 10.5, the Educational Facilities and Planning Committee. Um, if there is an update, if not, we will carry that over to February. Okay. Item 10.6, Nutrition, Wellness, Health and Safety Committee. If there is an update, anything uh, of importance to share? I know the work is important, but anything new that we want to hit on, we can or, or wait till February? I think we're going to wait till February till our next meeting. Great. Thank you. Item 10.7, the Policy Committee. Uh, same, same comments, if there is any. Yes. Good evening, Crown Years Policy Committee Chair. Um, just a quick heads up, we've been trying to uh, primarily focus on remaining current and uh, staying on top of all current, excuse me, current policy recommendations. So as you noticed, we approved two policies this evening, and that was the uh, work of our December 10th meeting. We also met on January 7th, and we reviewed policy 5670, records management, and you'll see that at the next board meeting. And as we keep current with this, it'll actually ease our turnaround after we approve the draft manual which is what we'll be working on in between meetings. We should have those section reviews ready by March. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Welcome. Item 10.8, the school calendar committee. Yeah, a quick update. Um, we probably will be meeting next week um, with the goal being to come up with uh, an advisory recommendation to the board. Uh, the student council, uh, I spoke with them last week and they're working with Ms. Carriero to put out a Google survey uh, to gather some student thoughts uh, on the calendar recommendations for next year and those uh, that information will be incorporated into the next meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, item 10.9, the transportation committee, same, uh, same comments. Item 10.10, .10, the Wall of Honor Committee. Same comments. And again, it'll be carried over to February if there's an update in February. No update at this time. Thank you. Um, item 11, no items for discussion at this point. On to item 12, which is our second public input. Is there anybody is here from the public that would like to speak during public input number two? Now would be your opportunity to do that. Please raise your hand or put your question into the chat box. I believe there was a question in the chat box, Jeff, that I read yep, there. I see it. So there was a, um, a question uh, from Dominic LaPierre with two uh, elements. The first was, please confirm that the district reserves are within the limitation defined by the state controller. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and if in fact we were not within the limit, uh, the auditors would have uh, noted that in their report. And question number two is, uh, with regard to the Sag Harbor Learning Center, please update the community on the new facility's current use and any anticipated changes uh, to future use and or future facility needs. So uh, due to COVID this year, um, we moved uh, the kindergarten uh, down to uh, the Learning Center. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll uh, with the vaccine rollout that 21-22 uh, will be different and we'll be able to return uh, the kindergarten to the elementary school. And if indeed that's the case, uh, we would look to run an all day pre-K program. Uh, and Ms. Reynoso and, and Mr. Malone are in the process of um, uh, addressing the necessary permitting to make that happen with the respective state office. So we'll know more uh, about future use when we know what COVID looks like uh, as we get closer to next year. Great. Any other questions? Do you see any others 
hands or questions, Mr. Fisher? I do not. Okay. With that, I will entertain a motion to close the meeting. So move. Is there a second? Second. second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening, uh, and we will speak soon. Bye. Good night.